Hey, hey, howdy. Welcome back all to role-playing on Limited Out of Character. Joining us on this fine Thursday evening, we have Evil Don. What's going on, brother? Hey, how's it going? And joining us as special guest host tonight, we have J-Man himself, the bald Wookiee, Justin. <laughs> You didn't know you'd have to bring your Sherry Wook Translator app with you tonight. If you didn't, make sure to download that. I'm sure there are several copies available out there. I, of course, am Tragically HP, Daniel, the Game Master, and we are here tonight with a slightly different format just to kind of discuss things on a more interactive level, both among ourselves and hopefully with you, the viewers. So, jumping right into it. Evil Don was kind enough to get the ball rolling with the first question, which he posted to our Facebook fan group a few days ago. And I'm going to let you take that from here. Sure. Uh, the question that I posed was, you know, what is your most memorable success in combat? You know, and it could have been any system or, or anything else like that. We didn't limit it to just Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and we've got quite a few answers. Um, one of my friends, uh, Rob, you know, he did the funny thing. It's like my divorce, you know, and, and things like that. Um, <laughs> but one of my friends, Lee, he posted up, killing a human boss monster in my first session with a DM with a necromancer, skill to kill undead, hmm. with Phantasmal Killer in the first round. Uh, the DM got so upset that I killed killed it that he added rings of death war to most of his encounters <laughs> <laughs> oh that's good um, oh. you know so that's pretty much a way to avoid a lot of you know hey here's phantasmal killer oh great mm -hmm. here's a uh, ways to prevent that <laughs> um my friend marion he played a he had a blind barbarian with 50 percent chance of missing in a 3.5 game 
managing to critical hit with a natural 20 with a Vorpal Great Axe, taking down a dragon. For a blind guy, that character was pretty badass. He died from a sonic attack. <laughs> but you know what? That would be a great way to avoid like a vampire charm or, or anything like that. Hey, my character's blind. I can't see, so there's no vampire charm. Oh, that's good. Um, Gail put in. Yeah, Gail put in. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you guys will remember this uh, we, when we were playing our Star Wars campaign. Uh, having everyone in our party think my character was an assassin when she was just a jeweler because jeweler, she had a bunch of natural 20s <laughs> when she would shoot her pistol. You know, she's like, but I'm just a jeweler. And it's like natural 20 dead enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she was definitely Captain Deadeye there for a good portion of our Episode 1 segment of Ultimate Star Wars. You know, and, and that was a lot of fun, because she played a jeweler, but it was more like a Force-sensitive who used the crystals as part of her uh, Force and everything. Uh, and the final one that I have is from Tony. In 2nd Edition D&D, &D, I was playing a pirate who was a fighter thief. This character did a backstab on a captor with a spittoon. <laughs> you rolled a critical success. <laughs> the combined modifiers allowed for a very memorable instant kill in a CD bar full of impressionable patrons. <laughs> oh, man. Natural 20 backstab with a spittoon. I hope somehow the spittoon became part of that character's nickname going forward. Like, oh my god, it's Sal the Spittoon Sladonis or what? <laughs> you know, or, I mean, stuff like that, you know, makes makes the game fun. Because um, I remember, you know, um, way back when, when um, I couldn't hit the broadside of a bar. <laughs> oh wait, that was our most recent game. <laughs> so, but remember when our most our other recent game, where the amount of natural twenties that came out was just absolutely unbelievable. Oh yeah, I think we had. I want to say like twelve of them in the first forty-five minutes of gameplay, and granted, some of them were me rolling initiative rolls for for people in the group and just by the law of averages I'm going to roll more natural 20s and natural 1s because I'm rolling all the initiative dice and all of those random utility rolls and stuff like that so that's why I tend to get a lot more natural 20s than more than anybody else in the group but even still right before we went to break that night I remember I had the trifecta I did the three natural 20s in a row it's like holy crap I haven't done that in 20 years what about you Justin I'd say a very memorable success in combat would be when I had a character who had become a god. <laughs> and he, Which one? Uh, uh, a certain swordsman by the name of Tlajanin. <laughs> Dan remembers this one well. I uh, was the god of war was one of the portfolios he chose <laughs> to be a god in, and as a war god, you have the ability to just do, like, an insane amount of damage and always hit. And I was just like, well, here, take this damage then. Yeah, that's memorable on both sides of the table, because that's a lesson for me that I try to carry forward to this day. Don't spend more time in prep than you'll spend playing the game. Because in that case, when I designed... Because we're playing 3.5 epic level rules, so I've got a hundredth level deity. I think I even might have pushed it to 120 or 130 because it was two epic level PCs going against him. But, I mean, this is like a week designing this character, creating spells for him, tactically thinking, okay, round, round one I'm going to do this, round two I'm going to do this. Little did I know round two was laughable because you would never see it. <laughs> yeah, when I saw the uh, war domain power it was just like here take a thousand damage every attack. I was just like, well i guess i'm taking that yeah yeah that's kind of the mire that 3.5 could easily become for a gm it's very hard to keep track of all of those different mechanics that are out there and for me this kind of uh this is another two sides of the table that i'll i'll toss don's way 
because one of the first responses that you were going into reminded me of a little tale between you and I at a, another Star Wars game, except it was a Star Wars live-action game about 20 or so years ago when there was this giant droid on a clothesline in the backyard that was like the defender of the city and nobody could go against it. And of course, my guy, the professional bounty hunter, has been contracted to find this artifact in the city. I do so. Find the artifact. Here comes the god droid. And you're assisting Carl this game in running the droid. And I start escaping and actually successfully blast it with my missile. And impromptu right there, all of a sudden the droid's got upgrades. And just like all of the monsters having the death ward in the future, this was very much an instance of, no, you're not, you're not getting away from this thing. <laughs> well, one of my favorites, and, and you'll agree with me on this one, uh, one of your Hackmaster tournaments. <laughs> and the Hackmaster tournaments was when we would place one character versus another character, and each one would give, you know, tell you what the scenario was. You know, they would design one battle. So the, and then the final round would be, um, the third round, would, if it needed to, would be your design so that neither one of us had any idea of what was going on. And I was playing a druid, 3.5 rules, and James was playing a fighter. And I said, okay, what I want is a murky swamp and <laughs> um, with trees and, uh, and stuff never like saw that and, and little fishies swimming around in there <laughs> and everything. <laughs> really well detailed on, on the swamp with the murky water and then first round i uh shapeshift into a goldfish and at that point with 3.5 i had the feats and everything to be able to cast spells in animal form so it's like just keep swimming just keep swimming it took me like four or five rounds just to get to him because of my size and the water oh, man. and he's looking around going where is it and I just touch him with a fin, and I hit him with a harm spell, <laughs> and I drop him down to four hit points, and then the then call lightning to finish him off. Which is noteworthy, considering, I mean, harm back in 3.5 just reduced you to one die four hit points, but it's also worth noting that this particular epic level fighter, 438 hit points or something like that, thinking, I'm going to just wade through this fighter, and I'm going to bathe in his blood. And little does he know, he's seconds away from only having two hit points left from one attack. And then he still couldn't figure out where it came from. And, and therefore, you know, the lightning <laughs> bolt coming in from out of nowhere, finishing him off. Because even if he made the save, there's no way to avoid, you know, it was like what, 60, 70 points of damage. Even half of that. And he only had like two, four hit points left. I mean, come on. He had no chance really in that combat. That was kind of one of the glories and the fallacies of that round of Hackmaster, because we didn't always do it that way, but that was kind of a two out of three rounds system where one player got to choose their dream arena, another player got to choose their dream arena, and so on and so forth. And it was kind of interesting when he picked the arena of an anti-magic field halfway up. <laughs> so that you couldn't really set up a battlefield where it's like total anti-magic field. I'm a fighter. I'm going against a wizard, and the wizard's sitting there with his staff, going, "Uh." <laughs> yeah, because initially he wanted entirely anti-magic, and we had to inform him, "Well, that's going to affect your magical gear as well." Oh, well, let's just make it up here so that I can at least keep him on the ground, and let's make it in like a thirty by thirty room so he's got nowhere to run. Yep, and I ended up losing that one, and then I ended up losing the uh, other match because, uh, yeah, it was a very high-level druid, but it was also a very powerful player. For myself, I tend to play a lot more as GM than I do as player. It's kind of a, a long stretch for me to try to remember a memorable character combat or, or a memorable success in a character combat. So for me, I tend to come back to the henchman that I was playing for our dear friend Darren way back in the day when he was playing the half-orc chieftain and he took the leadership feat, so he had a number of followers accompanying him, one of whom was the 
first level fighter Gronk. And during this particular combat against a Great Worm Red Dragon, Gronk successfully rolled three natural 20s sequentially against this dragon, which 3E rules plus our own little homebrew, home, homebrew extension was natural 20, okay, you hit. Natural 20, you have confirmed the hit. And because you've confirmed it with a second natural 20, roll a third time, and if you hit at all, you've instantly killed the creature. Well, because this guy's first level, he needs a natural 20 on all three dice just to hit. And that's exactly what he rolls. There were some jaws never to be saw, picked up. <laughs> yeah, I never saw a first level orc go up in levels so fast. <laughs> it was... It wasn't as astounding as we thought it might be. Like, I think people were thinking, like, oh, he's going to be, like, level 13 or 14. I feel like it was, like, maybe 6th or 7th level. But even still, that's a respectable boost, especially for 3rd edition. And depending on your GM, you could have easily had somebody that says, nope, one level max gain at a time. So, sorry, you're, congratulations, you're level 2. You've had the most epic progression to level 2 of any character in the history of the game. I mean, I wouldn't consider this a, a successful, you know, type thing. But what about Matheson? What What about Matheson's <laughs> character that, that strikes you the most, Dan? You know, while you were playing him. <laughs> I'd have to say the sheer befuddlement of trying to convey my points with logic and finding no traction within the group at all. I mean, we should do a little background. Um... At that time, I was playing Denshar with this backseat assassin monk who hated everybody. I mean, well, not the part of the initial group, but anybody new who came in, he instantly hated because he was evil. He was suspicious. Didn't make new you know, friends. He needed time to warm up. But when they first found Matheson locked up, <laughs> it was like, okay, I'm going to rescue you because the party's going to expect me to. I let you out. You go off on your way. And he's like, no, I'm joining you. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute here. And it was instant hate from day one. And that's a difference of opinion, too, because he didn't just say, I'm joining you. He asked you guys, like, so what's your what's your goal? Why are you here? I mean, he definitely kind of weaseled his way in as best he could, but it wasn't just a, I'm here and you you have to deal with it. He definitely, this is what I can do. I've helped you out in this way so far. You guys seem capable and you'd be able to help me out in this way. What do you say to an a mutual benefit kind of arrangement and there was due to the extreme neutrality of the group a whole lot of just and Matheson said okay cool I'm good I guess I'm I guess I'm in shit thanks guys and it wasn't until later that people were a few people started to take an issue with him and by then he was like well I'm part of the brotherhood man I'm in the group I'm part of the crew I've been here since act one <laughs> Yeah, but I, you know what? Denshar was against it from the beginning. And but, again, the whole neutral thing of it was nobody else did anything about it. Oh, for sure. I still I applaud Sean for somehow maintaining a paladin, even though even a chaotic paladin in that kind of campaign. Because just the process of trying to make any decision was strenuous. Well, I always thought, though, is that if you if you take on the role of a paladin character, your paladin should try to set a moral compass. You know, like Celestial tries to set a moral compass. We're not doing this. If it's a demon, we're killing him. If it's, if it's a person, we're rescuing him. Yeah, but we got, our, we got stabbed in the back a couple of times. Nope. It doesn't matter. We are going to rescue every person because this is our moral compass. You know, and I, I just didn't think that he took that kind of a role on it. But you know what? I, I, love, I love the character, though, because it started off as a bard and then became a paladin. So I could see where it's like, okay, I never really had all this paladin training to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing versus, hey, you're now a paladin. And you kind of imagine that's got to be the case with any paladin, be it good paladin, evil paladin, because they are a direct representative of their deity. So part of their daily to-do list is 
hey, so have I told you about this particular scripture right here, or have I told you about this particular tenant of my deity? Like, just in that process itself, the paladin character tends to take more of a leadership and front-of-the-party role. Right, because whenever Sluffiel meets new people, he walks right up. I am Sluffiel, Paladin of Tears. <laughs> you know, it's like there's no doubt of, of his mind that right. you now respect me because I'm a Paladin of Tear versus the fact that you could be a bad guy. And just going, oh, wait, I just want to kill this Paladin now because I'm such a bad guy and he's a good guy. What do you say there, Justin? What other memorable successes in combat have you been directly or indirectly a part of? I know you run a lot of games as well, so I'm sure you've seen some stuff that we haven't even been privy to. Oh, man, there's been so many. It's hard to really uh, pick one. I mean, there's always good moments in almost every game that has combat in it. There's always a memorable moment or a memorable line or something that somebody quips as they're fighting. So it's really hard to really pin anything down, in my opinion. And and that's true with every game, I mean, because there there are so many times where you can come up. Even when we used to play Nero, you know, and for those of you who have no idea what it is, Nero was the New England role playing organization where we did live action role playing, and I played a gypsy, and. Um, you know, Bonatifka was his intro to everything. Um, that was a lot of fun, but there was a lot of memorable things, you know, especially when you're dealing with live action role playing and spell packets and who's cheesing what. And like the time I got executed for stealing a magic sword that was never stolen <laughs> because it instantly bonded itself to me when I picked it up off the ground, when the noble said, hey, all this treasure goes to us. And it's like, um, I can't give this to you because it's bonded to me. So I'm not going to tell you about it because technically <laughs> it's stolen. <laughs> At least you didn't get killed during a training exercise. <laughs> That's definitely a unintentional memorable success at a combat that I'm sure Larry this day looks back on. How did I kill that guy? Man, that's literally the definition of a glass cannon. I think I just hit him for two points of damage. I'm a wizard. You're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> and Justin, you were part of the uh, plot team for that. What was what was some of the like the favorite plots that you had lined up for people? Oh man, there were some good ones, uh, especially back in the day with running with Mitch and Larry. Um, a lot of the stuff to deal with the uh, vampire Janorba, mm. and all those plots and schemes that he had going on, and all the a lot of the props that we ended up making for a lot of the scenes with him. You know, the dragon egg, the fire elemental. Mm. That was all a lot of good stuff back then. Yeah, and Dan. Um... What's our, what's our next topic that we're going to do? Well, you're coming in a little muffled there, brother. Oh, I'm sorry. What's our, what's our next topic? Well, the next one was my presentation suggestion to the group. And this one's kind of vague, so I understand why we didn't get a lot of interaction in the, the Facebook group with it. But it's essentially, from a GM as well as from a player's perspective, how do you handle the unavoidable difficulties that come up with running a game, whether it be attendance, whether it be communication, whether it be, as Don occasionally points out, cheesy power gamers that like to hide their their motives and secretly ex enhance their powers in mid-session, where, didn't your character have a plus three to attack last round? How do you have a plus five this round? Oh, I went up, you went up a level? Okay. Just all manner of those kinds of things that come up. In, in particular, for myself, the case that I was currently weighing on my mind at that time was lack of communication. For me, I am a game master that focuses heavily on communicating with my players, both during the game, of course, but also during the course of the week in between the games. Whether it be 
something as simple as, hey guys, just so you know, the game is on this week and we're meeting up at this time, who's in? Or something that requires a little bit more interaction, like the house rule that I proposed to you guys the other day for, hey, let's try this if your character reaches zero hit points in 5e and see how this goes instead of just, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down, I'm up. I mean, we had three characters in three different sessions that were just singing Chumbawamba from sun up till sun down because that was their daily experience, especially once they got to Avernus. So for me, the biggest the big issue was how do you handle players that don't communicate? And for me, the the tried old rule is patience. You gotta just continually try to prod and notify them through different aspects, whether it be, okay, well, they're not responding in this facet, let's try to reach out to them through text, let's try to reach out to them through their Facebook Messenger. Everybody's spread out through social media and so many different forms of technology in their house at any given time so it's easy to understand how easy it is to get distracted with certain things but there also comes a point as unfortunately came to with our group in that after strike one strike two strike three strike four etc 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 after so many months you just kind of have to do what's best for the game what's best for the group what's best for everybody obviously this experience isn't working out for everybody so we're going to proceed and hope we can catch up with you later on is essentially how that went you know <clears throat> and it's always tough when you're losing a player or you're you know <clears throat> because important things like that like that rule that you're proposing requires some sort of feedback. whether it's something as simple as hey i didn't understand what you were talking about or hey that's okay let's try that rule or i'm completely against it, you know if you don't have like a quorum on that come game time you know that's when it's turning around to um slow the process down a lot because if you have to discuss it like right before game time or in the middle of the game it just slows down everything at that point and you only have so many hours to play yeah that's very true i agree with that um can be hard um like you said people have different types of schedules and lives and communication might be hard to do sometimes but especially when there's a you know a week between games there's there's time for you to say something to somebody you know um, it's all about what you put into it and obviously if you're not interested enough to discuss the game between games then are you even interested in playing the game at that point very true. I tend to kind of, for myself, I just kind of look at like a 72-hour turnaround for text-based communications. Ideally 24 hours, but I understand, especially given the jobs that some of us have, how easy it can be for two or three days to pass by before, oh crap, two or three days have passed by. So for, in that instance, that's why I tend to do a lot of my communication as best I can on Wednesday or Thursday, like right after we've just played the game. So we have as much time from the end to the next beginning to discuss anything that went wrong, anything that went right, any ideas that we might have. And for the most part, we all do very well with that. Sometimes we, we just kind of get stuck in a, uh, a quandary with certain players where they just won't communicate with you. And in that instance there's really you're kind of left with no other options well and that too is that in and, and i it must be heartbreaking too is if you're on discord or you're on one of these other social media groups where you can actually see what other people are doing and you put up a response you know a question hey what do you think about this for the next game and you see them online and you see them in the very same media session that you tagged everybody into <laughs> and you still don't see a response it's like you are on the social media you have been tagged in this post can you take 30 seconds to pop in a response and then go back to doing whatever you're doing oh yeah and beyond anything else that you said there just to touch on your first words it's definitely heartbreaking to lose any player and 99% of the time, anytime we lose a player, it's because their work schedule changed or 
they're burnt out or they're playing too many campaigns at once and they've got to focus on this one. You guys have been with me for 20 something years. I don't kick players out of the group. It is very, very few and far between that things ever come to that point. And even when it came to the point in this particular instance, I gave the player private notice like hey just so you know this is where i'm at like it's kind of the bottom of the ninth inning and you're down two runs and you got runners on base and long story short you're either gonna hit a home run you're gonna strike out i'm not gonna privately notify you anymore just one day you're gonna log in and unfortunately you're not gonna be attached to any of the connected servers any of the connected games and that's just unfortunately how it had to go i it broke my heart to have to make that decision and you guys were there while I was making it literally 30 minutes before we're about to kick off a live streaming session. So I'm just kind of going through all kinds of emotions at that moment where I'm here to hang out with my friends. I just want to spend time with my buddies, but I'm also trying to create something here. We've been creating something collectively for decades now. So what ultimately is what's the pros and cons and we're at where we're at. Yeah, I mean, this channel is, is a great uh, example of that because, you know, we have been putting a lot of our creativity in private, making our games, playing with our friends and, and things like that. But now it's time with this kind of media and this kind of equipment that you can get for relatively inexpensive that you can now make a show like this. You know, whereas in the past, trying to make a show like this would require thousands of dollars in equipment, months oh, yeah. and months of time, and, and right now it's like, hey, let's let's get together 30 minutes of putting together what our topics are going to be, roll off the cuff, get your stories ready, um, put it on Facebook, hopefully get some people to watch us, and you know, let's go from there. Now, in addition to the communication difficulties and general attendance issues that I think every group runs into, and we're definitely going to be talking a lot more about that in a different context in the coming weeks, spoiler alert. But for both of you, uh, what are some difficult issues that have come up from your perspective as either a player or as a GM or both, and how were those resolved, if at all? Well, I had a scenario where I was running a weekly game and the only problem that people started dropping off because of, again, work issues and things like that, we weren't replenishing our people fast enough. So it got to the point where it's like, all right, I've got two or three players running in into this game, you know, that I've designed for five to seven players right you know right. let's just let's just call it quits at this point and, and that's where it had to end yeah, that's that's tough it's always tough when you have a game that's designed for a certain amount of people and we just don't have that many people i had to start i started a game the long running great hot game i played with only two players and so I started as a gestalt game because they needed, just needed that extra mm. oomph to fill out the, the, the party, basically. I, I threw a, a GM NPC to accompany them, and eventually we got more players, and it became a gestalt game with, like, six players, and it was Ooh. ridiculous. But, you know, it's just that way it went at that point. So I adapted, and it, it had to it, it steamrolled along, and it was a very memorable game. Um but one of the, the difficulties I have had as a DM is dealing with volatile player personalities. Because you've all seen them. You, you get some people in there that are a little intense in certain situations. And, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta adapt to it. You gotta be a babysitter sometimes. A psychologist, other times, Sad. just kind of, kind of have to work it out or, or kick them out. And I don't like kicking people out if I don't have to. Just like Dan, it's it's a thing I don't want to have to do. Um, sometimes they'll just kind of leave on their own. Right. So, okay, that, that works too. But other times you just got to be like, hey man, we're all just here to have fun, and 
you're doing is not fun and we got to change it or you need it or something else has to happen and luckily I've been fortunate in that that conversation has had happened a lot and but when it has it has had a favorable outcome so I'm pretty happy with that well and to link on to that though is that all of us have had that we're all human you know so we've had our bad days coming in so it translated into a bad day of playing or the dice are just completely against you that day so you get really frustrated and you know nothing seems to be going your way and, you know so and we've all been there and then again i've done it myself where i know it's like hey i'm complaining about x y and z where i really shouldn't be <clears throat> and i can look back at it now going why did i even argue that speak but for yourself just, man I, I mean, I've been a perfect gentleman at every session for like 20 years straight. So, I mean, you guys may have your weekly issues, but I, I am flawless. So, you just direct that shit elsewhere. <laughs> Obviously, I may perhaps be the absolute worst one of us all. I am highly emotional, but I think that lends itself well to good storytelling. And, uh... Hello there, uh, Val Theris. Welcome to Roleplaying Unlimited Out of Character. Thank you for joining. But, uh, yeah, Don, I mean, to speak more truthfully to your point, it's definitely something that happens to all of us at any given time. And sometimes we're a little bit better about catching ourselves at it in mid-process. Other times it's not until the next day that we wake up and there's that that guilty morning after feeling where you're just like, ah, oh, crap, man, did I really say that last night? Did I really do that last night? I mean, we're just trying to play a game, but it's a game where you're acting, so you've got to keep your emotions kind of at a certain level, and sometimes that backfires on you. It can work positively as well as backfiring, so I mean, the fact that we've been together for 20 years, most of us, I think that that's kind of a testament to we see it for what it is and we can just kind of move on into enjoying the game. Exactly. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it is, it is just a game. You do have to realize that at the end of the day, it is just a game, you know. But when you spend a lot of time and a lot of energy building these characters and, and breathing life into these characters, when you see them die over a bad, stupid role, or just stupid decisions that you made, um, it's just, it's one of those things where it just bottles up, you know, it just comes on out at the worst possible moment. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a uh, phenomenon that is often referred to as character bleed or just bleed. Hmm. And it's a very common thing to deal with in LARPs because a lot of times you are playing that, that character for an entire weekend and you just kind of get stuck uh. in that character's <laughs> space. And it's hard sometimes to differentiate that from what's really going on. And so you get like all worked up because your character's worked up about something, but you and that other person in real life don't have an issue. It's the, the characters. A lot of times <laughs> some people have real hard time reconciling that. And it can happen in tabletop too, especially if you really start to get into your character's headspace at that time. Definitely. And it's even more amplified when you're doing a live action role playing game because you're physically in the body of the character. You're dressed as the character, you're carrying the gear, you're reliant only on your own ingenuity and what the character card says that you can do. So I know, especially when you're talking a long weekend, and for many players, long weekends without sleep. Your emotions and your reactions and responses and all of that are not necessarily as in line as they might be on a usual Monday morning after you've had your breakfast and a cup of coffee. Well, another thing too, though, is when you're dealing with a long weekend, okay, when we started LARPing, it was brand new in Las Vegas brand spanking new we right. all started at the exact same power level at the exact same monetary level at the exact same everything pretty much you know your characters were different based upon what you made but we were all in the same power level and then the and next then, month 
<laughs> and then we have this, you know, visitors who've been playing this game for years and years and years come in, and their power is so so much higher than ours that they kind of stomp all over the game, <laughs> you know, and it's like the players got nothing out of it. While they were taking home all the loot, they were taking all the, the magic items, they were taking you know, everything else like that. And it's really difficult, and I'm sure it was really difficult for you, Justin, and the rest of the plot, because it would be the same thing if you were running Dan a game where it's like, okay, I'm bringing in a 15th level character, and all these guys are level fives. It's like, how do I challenge that 15th level character without wiping out all the fifth level characters? Yeah, fortunately, I wasn't on plot that early on in the game. I was still a player, so I didn't really have to deal with that decision. But yeah, I remember being a player <laughs> and watching those couple of high level guys like, well, why are we here? I unintentionally stumbled into, I, I feel it was Ramsey's character that Mitch had thrown in this protection bracelet. I forget the, the Nero mechanics, but it was a pretty powerful protection item that my character just randomly stumbled on. And I remember after the game and the weekend was all over, Mitch came up to me and told me in private, just, uh, you know, that was supposed to be for one of the high-level characters that came in from West, and one of them's kind of pissed off about it because they kind of paid for that item coming into the weekend, and it's actually not in his possession right now. I don't know what to tell you, man. I happened to be, I, I had the stake, and I staked the vampire, and I took the stuff because that's what you do. <laughs> yeah, but I had a lousy plus one sword, you know, and and I got executed. Over. So, you having that super powerful bracelet, I'm surprised that all the big guys just didn't pull out the big guns and just wham. I think the fact that I was there was so much plot and everybody was literally on the field at the same time, it worked to my benefit because I was able to just kind of grab it and. I'm going to back myself out of the crowd right here. All right, maybe we'll get this identified later. <laughs> well, and back then I was a lot younger and I was a lot skinnier. Well, okay, not as skinnier. But I was also playing a rogue, and I just loved disarming the traps. And, you know, and I loved it when they made that, that mod so that I could That's go through cool. and actually fly the skill. So I, I picked up all these ins and outs of just garbage <laughs> that I threw together to make a trap kit. <laughs> I dig it. That was one thing I was always jealous of the rogues in Nero was the fact that you got to interact with the props like that. Whereas for me, it was just all, if there was a prop that was going to fit a celestial mage, it's, hey, here's this spell book and here's the spells that are in it. Or here's this tablet with this magical etching on it and you're able to decipher it and basically whisper, 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 and then, okay, I convey that plot onto the rest of the group. So it was kind of a weaker draw for me in that respect, but the fact that I get to cast magic and didn't have to be up in the middle of everybody, oh, no, five, no, 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 that was definitely a, a fair trade-off. So um, back to our, you know, to our uh, last topic of the evening, uh, Justin, what, what do you have? Oh, what's the topic again? What's your favorite TV show? Sydney. <laughs> Scream oh, 5 coming out, by the way. How about that? <laughs> it's like we, we forgot to give Justin the cue cards because it was like it was like a last minute thing for, for Justin because he had a game canceled tonight. Oh, we forgot to send yeah. the Sherry Wook translator. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, that's a that's a tough one. There's a lot of good shows out there. Um, I guess it really depends on the kind of show, like the genre. Like, right. There's comedy, sci-fi, whatever. Um, so let, I say, so let's say sci-fi. I would say one of my favorite shows in the sci-fi genre was Babylon Five. Hmm. That was definitely one of my top shows in the sci-fi genre. It was excellent piece of storytelling in my opinion and for the time it, the graphics and stuff were top notch hmm. for the time um, as far as comedy that's a tough one there's a lot of good comedies out there um, 
Ooh. Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, I would almost say Family Guy, but <laughs> I don't know. I've recently been re-watching Third Rock from the Sun, and that is hilarious. I was thinking for our genre of interest, or genres of interest specifically, for me, Big Bang Theory has been very hard to surpass on a comedy level for the last decade, just because every episode is just, all right, here's something else I can identify with. Here's something else that I've been a part of. Wow, they're playing Settlers of Catan. How cool is that? Yeah, and all the things in there that, you know, us geeks, you know, would pick up on right away, you know. <laughs> And, and of course, you know, rock, paper, scissor, lizard, Spock, <laughs> you know, the very, very first time I heard that, I was like, how does that go? And, <laughs> you know, when he explained it two or three times, it's like, okay, well, this makes, you know, a little bit of sense. But, yeah, it's just, you know, it, it puts intelligence into a new light, you know, whereas most times, I mean, Sheldon was like a robotic character, but Leonard had emotion and and he was still a genius and so it made him human whereas everyone thinks oh you're super and a lot of other shows it's like oh you're super smart so you can't have emotion to go with it and leonard was uh, broke that mold on me yeah it's a cool dynamic between all the characters on that show and the continuity they build and how they expanded the cast throughout the series which is kind of rare for a comedy I find Gen they generally they tend to stick with the same characters or s actors leave the show and they end up being replaced with different characters or different actors playing the same character how about you Don what's what's uh, of interest to you when it comes to TV well <clears throat> there's I mean I love I love watching TV and uh, one of my favorites right now and it's a uh, it's a summer show and what they do is they do like 13 episodes and then you don't, you don't see it again for about a year or so but it's called Holy Moly and basically it's like the show Wipeout meets mini golf what? So the <laughs> golfers have to hit the golf ball towards the hole you know oh, like shit. a miniature golf course and then they themselves have to go through an obstacle to get to that <laughs> ball and if they fail the obstacle it's a one stroke penalty so one of them is called Hole Number Two, where it's a whole line of porta potties with a with a small um, runway, and what they would have to do is hit the ball down that uh, corridor towards the hole, and then they'd have to wait. And when the light goes on, they have three seconds to run across it before all the doors open and knock them into the water. Yeah, and there's another really cool one. Uh, I heard Gail from the other room. She's yelling, don't forget about Uranus. And there's a hole called uh, Uranus. And <laughs> basically what it is is uh, the planet Uranus in the middle of this ring. So there's a ring around Uranus. And you have to hit the ball around Uranus. And then if you get it right into Uranus's channel, you get the best position <laughs> when it comes out of Uranus. <laughs> but if you don't hit it right, oh, then dear you God. Kind of mess up Uranus. And then you have to jump across these planets to get to the other side, which is crossing Uranus. <laughs> well, we got some uh, chat log input there from Valtheris. Uh, True Blood. I have not watched that one yet, although we do randomly owned the first season that was just kind of given to us a few years back but we have not yet given that one a shot I've heard some good things about it there's some good uh, good talent on that show as well yeah uh, Valtrix, um what is what is your favorite thing about the show How did I know, though, for Dawn, that your favorite show was going to be a game show? I, I knew that that was coming, but I didn't. How did how did I forget that? <laughs> I don't know, because, I mean, I used to host uh, a trivia, you know, bar trivia before the whole pandemic thing. Right, right. And um, that was 
one of those things, you know, because as a kid growing up, I always wanted to be a game show host. Other kids wanted to be astronauts and, and firemen and things like that, but I wanted to be a game show host. Nice. Yeah, Valtheris has got some input there on True Blood right there. Definitely seems like it's got a few different elements to it. Might have to give that a shot. I would say for myself, it's no surprise to go right to the number one, which has been a constant, strangely enough, that's a term from the show, for the last 16 years, and that's Lost. Just because it was, for me, the first large group dynamic show that kind of told several different stories within an overarching narrative, so it was kind of cool to see, here's the story of this couple from South Korea, and even though they're a couple, each of them have their own story in their own right, as they should, and meanwhile, here's the story of this guy in Los Angeles who randomly won a lottery for millions of dollars, and it's been the worst curse on him ever since, to... Your police officer, your doctor, your nature wilderness survivor, and taking it a step farther to the location itself, to where the island kind of became a character, and it was for a D and D fan and a fan of all kinds of genres that they managed to tie in to make the island kind of seem like it had some mystical qualities to it, which it did. Some of it was also technical and scientific, but a lot of it was definitely mythical. Oh yeah, Lost is the, the one on the island with the plane crash, and even the way the plane crash happens, that's entirely mystical and technical at the same time and explained throughout the course of the show. And I like that they told the show kind of in a, a Quentin Tarantino-esque kind of fashion where you're getting the current and then the past, and then the current, and then the past, and then after so many seasons, it's here's the current, and then here's the future, and then here's the current, and then here's the future. So the story was not told in a linear fashion, which I just found fascinating. Additionally, I would say The Walking Dead has been a constant favorite over the last several years, although I did struggle with it for the first several seasons, as I was writing my own zombie apocalypse stories at the time, and trying to do things that are very different from what Walking Dead was doing, and designing my own original plots and my own original scary jump moments, only to then watch Walking Dead the next week and find, oh, they just did the same thing that I wrote last week. Is there a camera in my room or something somewhere? Are these guys, like, copying my shit? So, eventually I just came to realize there is nothing original you can do, or if there is, it's, like, the teeniest fractional percentage, so... I just stopped taking it offensively and whatever. You know, and I, I'm going to add two more to that list. And if you haven't watched these, I would definitely have, you know, have you add those on there. Lucifer, which is on Netflix. You can get the entire series on Netflix. Okay. And it paints the devil in more of a humorous light. Right. You know, and it doesn't, it does go into some theology. But it never goes into a preachy theology. Hmm. And it never portrays him as evil. It portrays him more as misunderstood. Hmm. Um, but the other thing is, is leverage. Hmm. And I don't know if you've ever seen the old ones or, you know, there's a new one now, Leverage Redemption. But Leverage is about a team that features um, a grifter, a hitter, a hacker, a thief, and a mastermind. And basically... These are all bad guys who came together and started doing good for people by taking out worse guys. <laughs> and um, the best thing would be like a Robin Hood scenario where they rob from the rich to give to the poor. So you may have like, you know, and the, the big catchphrase on there is the rich and powerful have, um, you know, all these advantages. And what we provide is leverage. <laughs> So they go in and they take out these bad guys. And my favorite part is at the very end when they show you how they set up all these things because it's all done through cons, it's done through um, hacking, it's done through theft, it's you know, et cetera and so on. But they run long games and it's a really, really cool show. And if you haven't had a chance to see it, I would definitely recommend it just be leverage. 
Where is that presented? Um, that I believe you could either find it on Netflix or Hulu. Okay. That that premise uh, reminds me of the show Blacklist with uh, mm. Jim Spader. Yeah, Spader. That's a good show. Yeah, I've heard great things about that one too. It's kind of the the case with every show out there anymore. We've definitely been inundated with a lot of great shows, which is both a blessing and a curse. I know for myself, I am eagerly looking forward to finishing the last two episodes of Fear the Walking Dead so I can finally, for the first time in years, be caught up on all the Walking Dead content. But I know it's mid-July now, and I feel like I got maybe another 70 days before the next season starts up, so my window of glee will be shortly lived. Of course, we can't not talk about The Mandalorian. Or the extension thereof, the book of Bob A. Feet. I hear good things about that. <laughs> hey, you, you put your lunch back inside of you. You know, I think what we need to do, though, is I think we get, we're going to need to revisit this topic and narrow it down to specific genres or specific type. You know, like, what's your favorite Marvel movie or new Marvel show or things like that? Because... We can go on for days and days because I love the Loki show. I oh, love, yeah. you know, WandaVision. Yeah. Um, I watched, you know, uh, Winter Soldier, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And Disney, they just do really great things with their, their superheroes that, in my opinion, it's really hard for DC to cover. It's definitely going to be a struggle for them to catch up. They're finally starting to figure out some of the Marvel formula, which is to not take yourself so seriously and let your superheroes be humorous, even if they are badass at the same time. That's why, bam, lightning with my hands, lightning with my hands. I mean, oh, yeah. once, Shazam. once Shazam came out, it was like, all right, you guys are starting to get it. And I was very happy with the Harley Quinn movie. They definitely took a lot of humor into that as well. I don't know if you really consider Joker as part of the current DC mythos. That's a great movie just in its own right, entirely removed from everything else. But uh, I think that's the beauty of this question is we don't necessarily maybe need to limit it so much as it can be a frequent repeat question because we're always going to think of other shows that we like. Other people might respond to another asking of the question, whereas they didn't respond this time. And it's a question that's always going to generate new interest because there's always new shows coming out. And just remember, you know, if you're watching this, if you want to answer any of our questions, all of our questions will be posted on our Facebook page. Um, we'll be posting them every week beforehand. Uh, we would love your input either on Facebook or live watching us, just like uh, Valorith, Valthris. Wow, I can't even talk anymore. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, we love interacting with people. And that's what we were hoping that this show will be different, is that we'll be able to read your chats, we'll be able to get back and forth. And as you can see in the window over there, we have the chats in that window over there while we're talking too. So not only are they it's on the side, there, but they're on the top. It's over there? I thought it was over. <laughs> oh, actually, it's oh, right there. <laughs> well, no, because, oh, that's right, because I have to point that way to get to it or something. Okay, so. But again, you know, um, we love interacting with people. The show will be broadcast again on, on YouTube, and um, it will be here on Twitch for people to watch again. Um so, Dan, what what do we have in store next week? A little sneak peek of what's to come. We are going to return to our streaming games, but it, we're not going to be streaming the Baldur's Gate game going forward. It's, it's a great campaign, and we're still going to continue playing it, but we're going to kind of pivot, pivot a little bit towards star wars which we have a campaign that we've been in progress for since 2005 so that's also a 16 year experience that we've collectively been involved in and ultimate star wars or star wars what if as it was originally called is now i want to say 
It's like 450 years after the Battle of Yavin in the first Star Wars movie. So we have seen a saga that is radically different than anything that took place in the movies and the cartoons. Because we began this saga in 2005, it predates the modern Clone Wars, the Rebels cartoons, anything that's Disney+, Plus, any of the sequel trilogies. It's been a blast of an experience, and we're finally in an era, an era that is entirely self-created. We're so far removed from Sith versus Jedi, from galactic politics, and all of the stuff that we're familiar with. So that's what we're going to be coming back to here in the next couple Tuesdays. I'm not sure exactly which Tuesday, but here in the next hour or so, we're going to be getting together and crafting our characters. And in the next couple of weeks, on Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Pacific, we will be streaming Ultimate Star Wars Episode 11. Thank you so much, Evil Dawn, for being here again as our co-host. And Justin, I can see the Force is with you there. And Valthras, thank you so much for dropping by in there. Oh, cool, that answers my question right there. I, had, I didn't know how you came upon us so it's very cool that uh you are attached to jason good brother right there we missed him tonight uh he's definitely gonna be with us for all of our campaigns both baldur's gate and ultimate star wars going forward so we will catch you all next time around thank you justin for sitting in as guest hosts and have a good night all take it easy Thank you.